to the eternally curious, unapologetically superstitious Midnight Society rejects, Stormy Willow welcomes you. We are the eccentric coots, storytellers, explorers, dabblers, practitioners, and paranormal pupils who examine the what's ifs, the what's that's, and WTFs of this dimension and beyond. Welcome to the Stormy Willow Podcast. I'm your host, Tits McGee. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Anchorman joke, Anchorman joke. I'm your host, Adele, and I am coming at you pre-recorded from Albuquerque, New Mexico, along with my co-host and sister, Sarah, coming at you pre-recorded from Rock Hill, South Carolina. Hey, you guys. <laughs> and uh, in case you didn't listen to the intro, this is the Stormy Willow Podcast, where we discuss all things paranormal weird unusual and what we consider fun <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> how are you Adele thank you for that lovely intro <laughs> yeah I'm good I'm good I just had a bunch of beet juice and other vegetables in there so I'm feeling the energy from it <laughs> that's great well you know what I'm on my second Miller highlight so I'm feeling my energy Ooh. from that so. <laughs> I, see I call that gas not not energy <laughs> I can't do the Miller High Life. <laughs> oh, I do. I do love a good Miller High Life. And I always thought this was the witch, the Miller High Life witch. But I actually read that it was supposed to be a girl in the moon. So um, Miller was sending females to the moon before we ever sent a man to the moon. How about yeah, well, that? There you go. That's some trivia for you. Some, fun, some Miller High Life fun fact for you. That makes me like the brand. All that and much more. Quite progressive, right? It was like it came out in the nineteen, like the early nineteen hundreds. So, yeah. <laughs> Cheers. I'm still gonna say it's a witch that just flew to the moon. I know it's the best. It really is. I I like. I, I will she'll always be the Miller High Life witch, and also an amazing uh, Halloween costume. It's never too early to start thinking about that. I've already been thinking, and I'm having a hard time coming up with one. <laughs> oh, I can't wait! It's a surprise. Can you tell us? Well, I really wanted to do Teen Wolf, but I just don't think I can practically do that. <laughs> that would be awesome, though. Yeah. Is Amanda going to be beef? No. <laughs> oh. I know. Who, who knows what she's doing? We, we don't do matching costumes anymore. We just cannot get aligned. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's really tricky to do. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe I'll just be some other kind of werewolf. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah. Just maybe a werewolf in general. Yeah. Lots of options there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, speaking of witches and um, all of that fun stuff, any guesses on what today might be about? I mean, I, I know you already know. But... Well, yeah, you already told me. But, um, <laughs> but if you didn't know. Perhaps witches? <laughs> yes. Just playing so, stupid here. Listen. <laughs> We're going to talk about my most favorite place I have ever been in my life, Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, if you have not been yeah. to Salem, I need you to go there. It I is, haven't been to Salem. It's amazing. I haven't I been it. to New England. That's like the one part of the United beautiful. States I've never been. It is absolutely beautiful. Stephen and I went there. Uh, Stephen's my husband. Um, for those of you who might be new to our podcast, but we went there last summer and you know, I was a little nervous. I'm like, okay, Sarah, I had to have like a real talk with myself. It's like, you might have built this up too much. Like you might, you know, you might get disappointed, like bring it down. It far exceeded every amazing expectation I had. <laughs> it was, it was my most favorite place. Like if it weren't for the winters, I would just pack up my shit and go. But I'm, I, sure, I'm I, sure it's not so bad. It's pretty bad. It's pretty cold. It's pretty, it's pretty frigid. Uh, um, just so, wear thermals. You're good. Listen, I just, I have come to the conclusion I just need to have a summer home there. <laughs> so I'll fly south, you know, my home in Rock Hill for the the winter, and then I'll head on, head on back to Salem for the summer months and Halloween, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is the 
I will say it is the coolest damn city I've ever been to in my life. There is just such this air of magic and awesomeness about it and wonder and this sense of crazy history that is there. And like when Stephen and I booked our trip, we had planned on, we rented a car because we're like, there's probably not like realistically going to be that much to do in Salem. So, you know, we can go to Boston for a couple of days. Um, a week is not long enough in Salem. There's so much to do. <laughs> it's amazing. So amazing. The people are wonderful. The food is delicious. And uh, the history is quite wicked. And we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the witch trials specifically in this podcast because I have so much to tell you about with Salem. I could just go all over the place. But we're going to focus just on the um, the witch trials and the murders um, that happen there. And that's going to be our focus for, for this. But in case you're listening and you're not really familiar with Salem, uh, just a, a quick rundown. It is a historical coastal city. It's in the county of Essex, Massachusetts, and it's located on the North Shore region. Now, it is. Um, it actually used to be one of the busiest seaports in the country. And a lot of people don't realize that about Salem. Like, you know, when you think of Salem, you obviously think witches. But it was actually um, one of the, the, I mean, seaports. It was like that was their business. Like, that's what they did. And um, you'll see how things at the end of the story come full circle from witches, seaport, back to witches. (laughs) I'm going to put I'm going to put that all together for you throughout the story. Okay. (laughs) again, if you haven't been there, Salem does a really good job of, you know, being the witchy city. The police officers literally have witch logos on their badges and their cars. I've seen it. It's real. And I think this is so freaking cool. So um, the public elementary school is called Witchcraft Heights, (laughs) (laughs) which I think is amazing. I would like some merch, please. And then the athletic teams go by the name The Witches. So they are all about it. And it's it's so cool. Um, So if you haven't been, witches are your thing. If history is your thing, Halloween is your thing. Salem is the place for you. Um, It's it's amazing. I highly recommend it. And so let's um, let's kind of talk about just the witch hunt. Like how how does like when did this happen? So Salem, like all of America, was you know inhabited by Native Americans, and we came over and stole their land as as we do. And so. Salem was colonized in in 1626. And so these witch hunts began in Salem from February 1692 through May 1693. That's not really that long of a time period, like you may think. Like you hear in Europe, like it was a lot, uh, a lot longer than that. But sadly enough, in the duration of about a year, more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft. 30 people were found guilty and 19 were executed by hanging. And one other man was pressed to death by refusing to admit that he was a witch. So that is not a long period of time for such horrible things to have happened. Um, that that honestly seems like actually a pretty large population of such small towns at that time. Yeah. Too. Well, you have to consider like it was a very small population, not like it is today, obviously. Um, and it just, it blows my mind. It, it just absolutely blows my mind. And so you might be wondering, like, how how did this shenanigans begin? Like, what, where, whoa, like, we come to America, we take over this land, and then a few years later, we start this witch hunt. Like, what, what started this? So you're going to see a lot of names that are going to appear quite often, and we're going to talk about how those names impacted this whole massacre and compare it to names that we might see today that <laughs> famous names and, and the one percenters and whatnot that we see. And a lot of, unfortunately, um, sad similarities that we still see happening today that happened back in 1692. Was there a Lindsey Graham? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, that will probably be whenever I do my um, when I do my story on the Civil War. <laughs> there we go. We're in a different part of this. We'll country. be like his great, 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 great grandma that he's named right. after, that little bitch. Right. Don't even get me started on, on that fella. <laughs> Shake that off. All right. So we're in January in Salem, 1692. So it's freaking freezing out there. Crops are not doing well. It's primitive times, to say the least. 
But then something strange happens inside of the family. Their last name is Paris with two R's and something really weird happens there. So it's sleeting, it's snowing, and the, um, the young so Would you that, say it's cold as a witch's titty? <laughs> you could say that, or you maybe shouldn't say that, unless you want to be accused of witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Betty Paris and her cousin Abigail start to twitch and twist with their bodies into strange shapes. So they're starting to act, you know, bewitched, if you will. And then they start speaking in tongues, like crazy words that make no sense. So they're twitching and they're talking in this weird tongues. Could it be they're just freezing? Maybe they're just freezing. I don't know. But Betty alarmed her father, the reverend. This is important Oh, great. You know, you know, every great story starts with a reverend. (laughs) Yeah, so Betty alarms her father, Reverend Paris, immediately to call the doctor because something's something's wrong, you know. Okay, and so to call the doctor. I'll what give does that. the doctor do? Well, she, the girl's bewitched. Obviously, it's not the fact that she could be bored, malnourished, freezing. You may say she's Have a bewitched. parasite. <laughs> I mean, that's the only explanation that it could be. And so, of course, concerned Reverend Harris is asked, like, who could have done this? Like, who could have, have bewitched my daughter? Like, how, how could this, or, or these girls, like, what could have happened? And so when they asked who, hmm, who do you think they might blame? Um, could it be, like, the one person of color that um, is their housekeeper and their slave? If, or I shouldn't even say housekeeper, that's nice. Their slave, Tabitua, who, or I always say it wrong, it's Tabitua who is not a white Puritan, well, of course, she would be to blame. It's witchcraft. She put a hoax on them completely. And so um, it's so she, Betty and Abigail said that Tabitua, their slave who worked for them, did it. And now she's uh, she's from Barbados. She and her husband are from Barbados. They're a slave to the Paris family. And they, she always played with the kids, like fortune telling games and just, you know, like just fun little games that were harmless. But of course, Puritans see anything fun as switchcraft. It's evil. It's the work of the devil. And so, um, they also, they, there are also two other women that end up getting accused at the time. And it's Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, who also, guess what? They're women that are also not very liked in the community. So these kids blame Svitua. Tabitua goes, uh, they take her to jail, obviously. And then, um, so basically this trial is such a freaking joke. They basically, she says, I am not a witch. I do not practice witchcraft. And they force a confession out of her. And so if they can, if they can basically force a confession out of you, then you don't go to the gallows, but you end up going to jail. And we've been to these jails, like what the mimics of what they look like. And they're basically like dog crates for adults. There's not even room to fully stand or lay. So like you're basically in this crazy crouched position. And if you needed straw or hay to keep warm, that's how they kept warm there or food, you had to pay for it. So like going, you might think, well, oh God, thank God that, you know, she, her life was spared, but where she went was horrible. And so uh, as she tries to plead her case, tries to plead her case, they're like, we know, like, they basically get this forced confession. And then she goes on to blame the other two people. So the other two ladies, um, Sarah Good, who was a poor elderly, um, who was homeless, and then an elderly woman named Sarah Osborne. So, and they're also witches. So they're like, great, I've got a confession, and I've got two more people, and that's what they're looking for. And so they're like, okay, well, we're going to find you guilty of practicing witchcraft, but because, you know, you confess, we're not going to hang you. We're going to just throw you in this jail. Forever? Or like? Until they can await sentencing and whatnot and figure out what to do with you. Because they end they're like, we don't know what to do with this, but we're not going to hang you. But we're just going to let you hang out here in this jail. For an indefinite period of time. Yes. Yeah. Just until we figure it out. And so basically, um, this is where hysteria breaks out. Okay. So as the weeks pass, other girls start claiming to have been infected by witchcraft. They accuse other town people of torturing them. And a few of the so-called witches on trial even named other people that were witches so that they could just not be hung. They're like, oh, God, yes, I did it. But Adele also was a witch. And Amanda's also a witch. And so then they're coming after you and then you do the same thing. And then we're just like going down a crazy rabbit hole. 
Now, what you're going to see, like, whenever I really get into the story, it ends up becoming a way where people catch on to say, I don't like you, Adele. I think that you're too mouthy. I think I don't like your opinions. I don't like that you're outspoken. So I'm going to get rid of you. And you know how I'm going to do it? I'm going to act crazy and call you a witch. And so like what? I said, Lindsey Graham is surely related to these people. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, we need to like, find, we, we need to go on um, Ancestor.com. <laughs> like, You'll just see a bunch of women that just look exactly like that bitch. <laughs> like, you're a witch. You're a witch. <laughs> so basically, you know, his family would be the judges. They wouldn't be the ones. That right. Would be, they would not. Yeah, they would be the course. accusers, not the yeah. accusees. <laughs> exactly. So then townspeople start getting smart. And it's like, you know, people that are talking back, giving me some trouble or I just may not like you. I can take care of you because I'm going to call you a witch and I'm going to start acting crazy. And then you either have to admit that you're a witch and go to the gala or say that you're either admit that you're a witch, go to this horrible jail cell and name other people, or you just step, you plead the, you just say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And if you don't admit that you're a witch, guess what happens to you? You get hung. Those are your options. Okay. So whenever we're talking about um, this court, <laughs> getting back to Lindsey Graham, whenever we're talking about judges and whatnot, um, there's something you've got to know about these judges. Okay. This could be, this is me talking about, I, I, this isn't factual. This is just me, Sarah's facts. I think this is when you start seeing the, the first case of America's first one percenters. Okay. In <laughs> this small colony, because these judges have a lot in common here. They're wealthy merchants, high ranking militia officers. All nine had been judges for years and were all members of a governor's council. Six of them were also related and five of them had attended Harvard, a training ground for young ministers, yet none of them became ministers. So they're like basically like a good old boys club, if you will. And according um, to a book by Emerson Baker, A Storm of Witchcraft, these nine judges were considered the elite of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And so in this book, um, Baker writes, as a group, the judges represented the proverbial 1%. The merchant elite who were wealthy basically exercised power in the social and political and military circles. In short, they were the super rich of Massachusetts, simply calling them merchants, short case, really short changes what their wealth was. So there you go. These people are all the one percenters. OK, so <laughs> um, it's really it's really sick. Um, but these these people range in age. The youngest judge was 40, like one was 67 and one was 60. So they were all between like that middle age. Kind of not very likely, not very progressive if you will. Now, where this is going to get, um, in case you're wondering, also, just a fun fact for you, Nathaniel Hawthorne is related to Judge Hawthorne here that sentences these people. And he, it was his great, great grandfather. And he is so ashamed of, his, of him, he changes the spelling of his last name because he doesn't want to be associated with Judge Hawthorne. So just for the uh, listeners, Nathaniel Hawthorne is the guy that wrote The Crucible, right? Yes, and The Scarlet Letter. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I don't think I don't think Nathaniel wrote the Crucible. Um, I always get those two mixed up. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote the Scarlet Letter, but the Crucible, I think, was somebody else. Hang on, I'll tell you who. The Crucible. Arthur Miller wrote the Crucible. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so Scarlet Letter is Nathaniel Hawthorne, whose great great grandfather was Judge Hawthorne. Who was one of these judges in this horrible thing. And I also just want to say, I also stayed at the Hawthorne Hotel, which I highly recommend if you're booking a trip to Salem. It was wonderful. It was amazing. Um, Bewitched the cast stayed there whenever they were filming. And it's just, it's an amazing place. So I'm going to recommend that place for you too. Um, so this is, this podcast might be a little, when I was writing my notes, I was just going to leave it at, you know, this many people were hung. This one person was pressed to death, but I really thought that it was very important that we say their names on this podcast and we say who they were because they deserve that. Mind you, none of these people were witches. They weren't evil. They were just people that you're going to see spoke out against the one percenters. They're the people that questioned authority. Um, not all of these people are women. 
some of these men are progressive that also spoke out saying this is crazy. So guess what? We got to take care of that. We can't let that happen, you know? And so and even if they were witches, like this is just complete nonsense either way to do this to people. <laughs> Horrible. And so I just, you know, I, I toyed with making it shorter, but it just didn't feel right to me. I felt like we needed to say their names and just put say a little segment about who they were. Um, so bear with me because I'm going to I'm going to read all of them. <laughs> now, these are mind you. These are not the people that were just accused. These were the people that died. OK, these are the ones that didn't do what everybody else did and say, I'm not a witch or that said, I am a witch. And here are some other names for you. These are people that says I am not a witch. And I'm not going to admit it. And I'm not going to turn in anybody either. So they're they're heroes in my mind. So we're going to start with the first person that was hung. And her name is Bridget Bishop. She was around age 50. And she was a widow that lived in Salem. And she had a bad reputation around town because guess what? She basically had run-ins with the law. She wasn't the first person to be accused, mind you. But she was the first person to actually die because she would not admit that she was a witch and so she was brought to trial on june the 2nd found guilty and then they hung her at the gallows on june 10th do we know what her run-ins with the law were she's progressive she was a widow she owned a lot of land she left a lot of land that's the big thing she owned an apple orchard and so there was talks about hey i can knock her off take a land here we go. And, you know, and she was, you know, back then women, hell, I'm talking about like even today, women were property. And here's a woman that owns property because she's a widow and she's a smart woman and she doesn't look to marry quick and take on, you know, those roles that women should have taken or were told that they should take on. And so she would speak out about it and people didn't like her. They're like, oh, you know, this, here's this woman property owner has the audacity to, question the law she's got to go so i took care of her she's the first one second one sarah good you'll remember us talking about her a little while ago now she was one of the first three that she was the one that took a bus like sarah good like she was one of them <laughs> so she was accused but then she was also um she also goes to the gallows as well she lived in the salem village she was the wife of william good and at the time of the witch trials she was poor and pregnant and would often go door to door in Salem begging for handouts while her husband worked as a day laborer. She was one of the first people accused, as we mentioned, um, when the, um, let me see. So her trial started on June 29th and then they hung her on July 19th. So she's a beggar. Really you know, fast. A pregnant beggar. Can't have that. And they didn't care that she was pregnant. They were bringing into like, well, no, oh, all the unborn baby be, crap. This child would be like a demon child. So, that, of course, that baby had to go too. I mean, we can't. Of course, the baby was also evil. Uh, yes. So, can't, uh, you see how absurd this is? Next, Elizabeth Howe, or Howie, age 57. Elizabeth lived in Topsfield and was the wife of a farmer, much like Bridget Bishop. She had also been accused of witchcraft before. And in her previous case, she was accused of bewitching a local girl, but there were no charges brought up. But then she was later, um, she later refused admittance to, um, to an incident. And then she was accused of witchcraft again. Um, so they said that she afflicted girls in the Salem village. And she was arrested, brought to trial on June 29th, executed July 19th. So again, they're just. The same day they executed the other yes they're good yes so they're just next susanna martin age 71 like come <laughs> on dude to make it that far back then right dude. susanna martin poor widow and much like bridget um she was accused like a lot of these women have been accused before but this was before the frenzy started so um she was um accused of tormenting people as a specter so what they would say is like say that i'm asleep or something but i'm gonna send like an image of me to come to you at night and do like crazy wicked stuff to you and so that's what they said she did to people oh so <laughs> they, people had bad dreams of her 
Yeah. But no, I mean, she was really there, like, sucking the life out of them, just like Winifred Sanderson. Yeah, of course. It was real. It wasn't it was real. a dream or a complete yes. fabrication. So, again, I mean, the, I guess July 19th was a, a huge killing spree because, same thing, she was accused on June 29th, took her on July 19th. Rebecca Nurse, <sighs> age 71, well, like in her 70s as well. She was an elderly grandmother and a wife of a farmer. And she was a um, very popular woman with a long stand that had a long standing feud with the Putnam family over border boundaries between their adjoining land. So she disapproved of the controversial appointment of Samuel Paris, which remember that name, right? Who was a close friend of the Putnam. And so they basically accused her, <laughs> they testified against her and they had found her not guilty. But then, um, they read the verdict out loud and the court and then the girls that were supposedly afflicted started going nuts and they begged them to reconsider their decision. And so then they came back with a guilty verdict. And then she was also hung. Because I mean, it's crazy. Like these girls just start going bananas. Like, yeah, that, that I always think of the crucible. Yes. It's just like, wow, you little bunch of. Yes. Buttholes for lack of better words. <laughs> right. Okay, so on to Sarah Wilds, age 65. She um, was a wife of a local judge, John Wilds, and she had a, she had a bad reputation because in, 19, in um, 1649, she was accused of fornicating out of wedlock. Ooh, she was Ooh. Lucy Goosey. And in 1663, she was accused of wearing a silk scarf. What a right. slut. What a slut. But then after she married, her um, married a widower, John Wilds, in 1663, um, John and Mary um, Reddington, the brother and sister of her new husband, or I'm sorry, of her, of her new husband's late wife, so her in-laws, I guess, kind of in-laws, developed a hatred for her. And then they began spreading rumors that, guess what? Not only are you a slut, you're a witch. Yeah, of course. It goes hand in hand, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And so after, um, so Mary ends up passing away, but then her friends still continue to harass Sarah and like just see to it that, you know, this girl gets taken care of. And so after, um, so basically um, they just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And then um, they finally bring her to trial and they hang her. <laughs> So it's like her accusers have passed away, but her the friends of the accusers just had to see this through because I mean justice had to be served. Like you cannot wear a silk scarf in public. Unbelievable. I hope and she like things. wore it around her neck when she was hanged. Fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> That's like really so all right, so now we're gonna get to our first male who was also a reverend, Reverend Ger George Burroughs. He's in his forties and he was the only Puritan minister to be accused and executed during the witch trials. And um, so basically he was a, a minister in Maine during the 1670s, but he left a settlement and then he was attacked by a bunch of Native Americans. And then he later settled somewhere else in Massachusetts before he was asked to serve as a new minister in Salem village. And so the residents of Salem just didn't like him. They were just like, he, we just, we, we don't, we don't like this guy. Like, he, no. Well, he, like, smell or <laughs> I mean, who knows what those Native Americans probably did to him. Like, you know, like, we just, we don't trust him. So they never paid him a salary. So he had to borrow money from the Putnam family to support his family because they already paid him a salary. And so, um, so when he stopped being paid altogether, he's like, I've got to leave Salem and return to Maine because I've got to support my family. And so then this Putnam family sues him for failure to repay his debt after they accuse him of witchcraft. Well, <laughs> so like, how is he possibly supposed to repay anyway? Exactly. He can't turn up. <laughs> so Burroughs is arrested, brought to trial on August 5th, executed August 19th. <laughs> what is up with the 19s? In this I know, story? like, right? That's weird. Okay, so that's our first male to have gone to the gallows. Next, we have Martha Carrier. She was age 33, and she lived in Andover and was the wife of Thomas Carrier. 
And she was also, guess what? A little too outspoken. She talks a little too much. She and had so, to go. <laughs> she had to go. It makes, it makes you think of Adam Stanley values. <laughs> With, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. With the Black Widow that Uncle Fester marries. Yeah. She had to go. It's so true. So Carrier was the first person who lived in Andover, which was near there, but she was accused during Salem witch trials. And her neighbor, um, Benjamin Abbott, after the two had a dispute over land, immediately fell ill. And so her children were also accused and were coerced into testifying against their own mother. Jeez, <laughs> come on, she people. Brought to trial on August 5th executed on the 19th of august so it's Why? like what is up with the 19th dispute with her neighbor he falls ill so obviously she put a hex on him right but then her own children testify against her like it's this just i don't know it's just crazy all right john will um willard he was around he was in his 30s and he was a deputy constable in Salem at the time of the Salem witch trials. And he was one of the first people in Salem to speak out against the witch trials. So he's like, this is stupid. Like, this is dumb. So because he was responsible for helping to arrest the accused witches, he soon began to doubt so many could really be guilty of witchcraft. It's like, this just isn't right. And so he quits his job in protest. He's like, this is no, like, this is wrong. And so shortly after... They decide to accuse Willard himself by Ann Putnam, another name that we, the Putnam family, who, Ann Putnam Jr., who also accused him of beating her baby sister to death. Willard was not immediately arrested, but his in-laws, the Wilkins family, began to grow suspicious of him. Willard was accused a second time by his wife's grandfather, Bray Wilkins, after Wilkins fell ill upon receiving a cross look from Willard. A crossed look. Crossed look, like a mean look. And then all of a sudden, basically, like, that's what you do when you put spells on people. You give them a look. You're, like, drawing an aura. That's exactly right. <laughs> and then he dies, and his body was um, found bloody and beaten. And according to court records, to the best of our judgments, we cannot apprehend that he died an unnatural death by, um, by the hands of witchcraft. I mean, obviously, that's what I would think. I mean, I mean, I yeah. just think it's easier to call these people a little bit stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I understand, well, like, you know, not great education, but just this is the problem with whenever you have religion and religious thinking guide logic. And when you have, when you don't, I'm, I'm just, Lindsay, I'm saying this for you with, uh, in light of um, recent activity. When you don't separate church and state, here you go. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just my comment on our, you know, our new local, or our, not local, our new Supreme Court justice, all the terrible questioning that came from him. And like, every, everybody voting no, unanimously saying like, yeah, she's totally qualified, has great background, <laughs> but I'm voting no. Yeah. <laughs> Come exactly. on. Yes. yes. Okay. Sound anyway. familiar? We've changed so much since then, in the 1600s. Um, so here we go. So um, John actually already fled Salem Village. As he knows that like, he's worked in this and he knows what they're coming for him. So they issue a second arrest warrant and they basically hunt him down and arrest him in New Hampshire. And um, the and so it's just it's crazy. Like they're like we've got to find find this guy. Like they hunt him down. And so all these people confessed. Um, all these people confess that he was definitely a witch and that he even attacked or afflicted a girl and Putnam Jr. who we, well, she's been, a, you know, been a victim of quite a lot of these uh, stories. If that sounds familiar, that's name, but she said that she saw many ghosts of people Willard allegedly killed and that he was brought to trial on August 5th, executed on the 19th. So that's evidence. I saw the ghosts of the people that you killed. I, I just love that the, the logic is that they can, these witches can do all of these supernatural things, but they can't just, you know, disappear from trial. One like, of these, um, <laughs> when, on. yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because they do like these reenactments in Salem. 
and you can go and like see you can they still have the original documents like court documents that you can see and um it's so crazy because I believe I'm probably wrong, but one of one of the accused, and I feel like it was Bridget um, Bishop, and I could be wrong on that. So don't quote me. That is what she said. She's like, if I were a witch, then I would be out of this situation, and I would, you know, I wouldn't be in the situation if I were a witch. So she tried to use logic, and they were like, oh, no, like you are a witch. It, it just thought about it. it. <laughs> thought about it. Like, what do you mean? Like, are you threatening us? And so you could not reason with these people they unless they could get a confession with out of you or send you to the gallows you could not win you could it's just like in a batman with the scarecrow like execution or exile i mean it's well, execution true. by exile it's horrible <laughs> So we're going to go on to George Jacobs Sr., age 72. And I I know you mentioned earlier, like, to make it to your 70s in such primitive times, then this is how you go out. Like, that's just, I I just, I don't know. I have a lot to say about that. At least they went out remembered. (laughs) Well, that's the truth. Well, George was accused of witchcraft by several people during the witch trials, including his own granddaughter, Margaret Jacobs. He was a reluctant churchgoer and was an outspoken critic of the Salem witch trials. Dun, dun, dun. So he didn't like church. (laughs) He's like, I don't, and I think, I think this is wrong. (laughs) He was, um, now he was first accused by his servant, Sarah Churchill, who also accused his granddaughter, Margaret Jacobs. His son, George Jacobs was accused as well, but he evaded the arrest. And many people testified against George, um, including almost all the members of the Putnam family. He was found guilty on August 5th, executed August 19th. 19th. And then after that, um, Jacob's family retrieved his body from the execution site and buried him on the family land. Which I'm like, you know, fuck you. You're the ones that turned me in. Like, Yeah, like, why did they do that? Exactly. Ugh. All right, John Proctor, age 61. John Proctor now is a wealthy farmer. He lived on the outskirts of Salem Village, but guess what? He was also an outspoken critic of the Salem Witch Trials. And he had to go. He had to go. Um, He often threatened to beat or whip the afflicted girls for their role in the Witch Trials. (laughs) I like John. I like him. And you know, a lot of just because it's top of mind, I think Gentleman Jack season two is about to start on Sunday. Um, It's Ann Lister pretty much. If she weren't in England in in Salem at this time, she would have definitely been, you know, a witch (laughs) accused of being a witch because she was a a woman who pretty much behaved like a man and took care of her land. Well, married another devil. woman in secret it's, like well the um, devil, it's the devil but what i love about her yeah. and john proctor is something about these two she always threatens to horsewhip people <laughs> i mean listen i i am not a fighter but sometimes you, like these girls just need it i mean some but desperate she just time, vlogging. i mean yeah I, I, john's not wrong let's just be real and i'm gonna tell you something really sad I, i'm just gonna go ahead and kind of i'm gonna finish raving uh, so we still have some more people unfortunately that um died but i am going to tell you that these girls that did this guess what happens to them they get dysentery nothing they all pretty much live normal lives after uh, this little over. fuckers yeah you know that's so typical though of course they do. Sickening. But anyway, with John, um, which I love that he threatened to beat or whip the afflicted girls for their role in the witch child. Yeah, you're not wrong, John. Um, but his wife, Elizabeth, was also arrested on charges of witchcraft. And the afflicted girls turned on John during his wife's examination. And like, not only is she a witch, but guess what? So is John. And so basically his entire family is arrested on charges of witchcraft. And Proctor, like, you know, he he knows what's up. He he knew that Salem was in mass hysteria. And he wrote a letter to the Boston clergy in July asking that they intervene and move these trials to Boston. So, I mean, he's like me. Like, I write, I write Lindsey Graham. I write my folks all the time. And I feel like John is like this. John's like, hey, 
we need some help here. Like, this is not okay. Um, but the clergy responded too late to say Proctor, who was still brought on trial on August 5th and executed on August 19th, that his remaining family members were never charged or found guilty and pardoned. So Proctor's body was reportedly retrieved from the execution site and secretly buried on his farm. So even though he was too late to save himself, um, he did help save his family and other people. Um, Alice Parker, her age is unknown, but she was the wife of a fisherman and a couple lived in Salem where Alice was known as an honest woman, but she had a reputation of clairvoyance and on one occasion successfully predicted that her friend's husband had died at sea. And so um, on May 1692, afflicted girl Mary Warren suddenly accused Alice of being a witch. And so during her trial, um, she made several surprising accusations against her, claiming that Parker bewitched her mother to death, made her sister ill, and drowned several men and boys in the sea, including a man named Thomas um, Wasgate and his entire crew who drowned after their ship sank, which is totally Alice's fault, like 100%. And so she was brought to trial on the night, executed on September 22nd. So her, yeah. she's such a powerful witch, she can make an entire fleet go down. I think they had her mistaken with a siren, you know, like the, <laughs> right. the ladies that made the thing she is like, you know, you look at these trials and it's like there's no evidence. Like there's nothing. It's just like it's it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, and it's just like a bunch of little girls like driving all yeah. this, which really and drives the, me nuts. There's a lot of th- theory and speculation on one: the girls were they agged on by who their family was? Possibly. Two: um, one of the theories is um, that they could have had poisoning from this rye bread that was popular at that time, so they really could be having fits and whatnot and hallucinations. Like that's true. But to take it as far as calling someone a witch and then all this stuff happening, it's just like a whole nother level of craziness. And then um, some theories say that these girls are just bored. They're just looking for drama. I mean, they're just. I I think they just liked having this amount of power. They're like, you have these these kids. And I watched a thing on History Channel that said, you know, you have these girls that from the time that they're born, like they're basically like you're going to go to hell for anything, you know, and they live these crazy strict lives. And so it was a way of basically getting some attention, you know, having, it's a lot. So, I mean, it, I think it could be a combination of all of those things. They're really. just like the original mean girls. Yeah. Except for like people fucking die a lot. And yeah. like, what we're talking like maybe a year, a little over a year. Like you would think that like, I always thought before I went to Salem that these, which, trials went on for years but it wasn't and then another misconception too is um none of these witches so-called witches um were ever burned they were all hung except for um giles who we'll get to he was pressed to death but um i don't even think that, seas, it was i don't different. think these should be called trials though i think it's that's the a trial. what actually happened to these people these yeah. were just hearings and blatant just prejudice just gonna murder you there was no type of trial this is not a trial and then it's like the um you know the witch trials overseas happened for several years and they would get burned at the stake but no one got burned at the stake here which i mean but when they would hang them like they wouldn't do like a quick release and so they would literally swing and just have a slow death and people would just stand there and watch it and it was just it's it's horrible it's absolutely Human nature at its fucking worst. Oh, so they purposely strangled them to death. Pretty much, yeah. It wasn't a quick wow. like drop. It was uh, yeah. like a slow, painful, and then like, everybody's watching, and you didn't even do anything. And it's just it's terrible. And the thing, and I'll um I'll continue on, but um just kind of going off topic here. The thing I I love about Salem, Massachusetts, so much is that we did several tours, and some of the greatest tours I've ever been on were in Salem, Massachusetts, and. The thing that that whole city believes is that they have to tell the story over and over and over and over again because it could happen again. And like, and it has happened. So like, look at gay rights. Look at Black Lives Matter. Look at women's rights. People have died because similar things like this. And so it's that city's mission to be open. Like it is like Pride Central, and it's like 
you know, it, it's that city's mission to tell this story and get it ingrained people's heads that this could easily happen again and again and again. And that humans, sometimes we don't learn from this and we're, we see that play out all the time, you know, and that's what I love about that place is that it's their mission to tell this story and to make sure that these people are never forgotten. I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. Like it really is yeah. it's a special place. I mean, it definitely seems effective with Massachusetts being so ahead of the curve on a lot of laws, especially exactly. like they get gay it. marriage and things, you know? Like, I th- I would say that Massachusetts, um, especially Salem and that whole area, they are a place to learn from their past. And they make it a point that, no, we can't have this happen again. So I think other places like the South, you know, I think we're, we're coming around to you and we're learning from our past. And, you know, we all have a past in America. Nobody's nobody in America has a beautiful past. I mean, we were founded on stealing land away from people and trashing it. Like we talk about all the time. Um, but I think the towns and places that are embracing who they were and say, saying, hey, we got to we got to change and we've got to be open and we got to continue to tell the story so that it doesn't happen again. And we need to honor the people that whose lives were taken. It's important. It's important that those stories live on. And Salem does Salem does it better than anybody, any place I've ever been. But they're just a whole step above just I don't know you just you have to go it's just it's, it's a special place it is such a special place it really is um but on that note I'm going to continue on with the victims since we still have a few more isn't that horrible this is horrible like are you seeing the similarities in all of these people yeah um, you could have Pat- just summed this up in one story but with several people's names uh, yeah I, yeah but basically I'm not saying that you should have but I'm it's just like yeah okay of course that happened too yeah that one is I want to shout out, you know, they deserve it. Um, Mary Parker is in her forties widower. Um, and same thing. She was accused um, by somebody else. Because, she was a widower? Yeah, a widower. Um, she was basically accused of afflicting a lady. Um, and then afterwards they're like, Oh, I'm sorry. I was mistaken. It wasn't her. Oops. Oopsies. My bad. Um, and um, Pudator, P-U-D-E-A-T-O-R, in her 70s, widow. I see a lot with the widows, which is crazy. Um, she had worked as a nurse and a midwife, and she had a reputation of having a sharp tongue and quarreling with locals. And she was accused by Sarah Churchill um, and some of the other girls in Salem Village um, because they said that... Um, that some of her medical supplies, such as foot ointments, were her uh, basically objects of the occult. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. My question is, did it work? And uh, if the person who received it, you know, felt better from it, did they really care? <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, Wilmot Red, then um, we don't know the age, but Wilma um, actually lived in Marblehead, which I've been, and it's beautiful, but um, she was the wife of a fisherman. And like Bridget Bishop, other um, folks just didn't like her because she had been accused before. She wasn't popular. Uh, she often quarreled with others. She had a very abrasive personality, which, hello, have you ever met anyone from New England? I love their abrasive personality. It's the fucking best. <laughs> But um, they just didn't, they didn't like her. So she had to go. She was too outspoken. So same thing. Um, so it was just terrible. So she was um, executed as well, but on September 22nd, not the 19th. Margaret Scott, age 77. Guess what? Widow. Seven children, but only three survived childhood. And after her husband died, Scott was left destitute and forced to beg her neighbors and people just thought she was kind of annoying you know so we had to get rid of her so she was a witch done Uh, yeah like a witch would be going door to door begging begging exactly come on exactly samuel ward well age 49 carpenter from andover also well-known fortune teller fortune teller and practitioner of english folk magic it is believed that his work and the occult led to his witchcraft accusation. So he was accused and jailed and failed. Okay, that, that one somewhat makes sense. <laughs> like he's, well, he's listen to learning this. about the occult. 
<laughs> I mean, but do you blame him? He's probably like, well, shit. I mean, I need to find out what this is about if I'm probably going to get accused of it. <laughs> but during his examination, he admitted, hey, like, yeah, I do some fortune telling and I dabble in magic. <laughs> and he said that the devil may have taken advantage of him for those reasons, but then he um, confessed to making a pact with the devil, but later recanted his confession. Wardwell was brought to trial in mid-September and executed on the 22nd. So I don't know if, like, it was a strategy with him. Like, maybe if I just tell him that the devil made me do it. And then I think they were just like, meh, no, no. <laughs> Martha Corey, age 72, um, she lived on the outskirts of the Salem village and was the wife of a wealthy farmer, Giles Corey, who we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And Corey had a reputation. Um, he was basically well. Um, he was a child. He was a child out of wedlock. OK, so he was just trash. Oh, okay. um, so Martha was also outspoken. So he's a bastard child. Mary's someone that's outspoken. So obviously, Salem they're a village. match made in hell, according aren't, to these people. <laughs> aren't a fan of them. Um, and so during her own examination, she told the judge that we must not believe all that these distracted what these children these distracted children say. And of course, um, in March, Giles Corey testified against his wife in court, stating that she had maybe she may have been bewitched, she may have bewitched his farm animals and himself. <laughs> <laughs> he was accused of witchcraft and arrested in April, but he refused to provide any more information on Martha or himself. But then Martha was brought to trial September 9th and executed on the 22nd, just three days after her husband had been tortured to death. So it's wow. like, Corey, what are you doing? Like, why are you trying to play roll her under the bus? Like, yeah, like, why did he do that? Was he like, I maybe if like, I just give them something, they'll leave us both alone? Yeah, maybe Obviously, I'll, that hasn't I'll worked. admit it. Yeah. I think these people are desperate and put in desperate situations. Like you said, this wasn't a trial. It was like, you're gonna, we're going to kill you. We don't like you. I mean, we, you're an embarrassment to our village anyway. You're married to this outspoken person. It doesn't matter what you do. Like, we're going to, you're going to lose. Yeah, we got our last like, sheet. If Amanda's taken in to trial, I'm like, yeah, she's a real bitch, guys. Yeah, um, she definitely does witchcraft, and like, I saw her. I'm scared for my life, but she's got to go. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm right there with you you're, guys. Like, you're what? Not safe. Like, you're not. Like, <laughs> and I think that she's probably also hurt our animals. So, yeah, she's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Mary Etsy, age 58. She was a sister of an, of an accused witch, Rebecca Nurse, which we talked about, um, and Sarah Cloyce. And she lived in Topsfield and was considered a well-respected member of the community. But on April 1692, Mary was accused of witchcraft, arrested, then released in May. And then she was accused again a few days after her release and arrested. She was examined and in indicted on two charges of witchcraft. Etsy was brought to trial in September and executed September 22nd. Like to get out and to come back. Now these are all the, so those, that completes all the folks that were hung. And then we've got Giles Corey. He was age 71 and he refused to enter a plea and he was tortured to death. So Giles Corey was a wealthy farmer who lived on the outskirts of Salem village. He had a reputation of being an angry, violent man and was once charged with murdering his farmhand in 1676. He was found guilty, but only suffered a fine for his actions. Many locals, including Thomas Putnam, suspected Corey had paid a bribe for his feet. I mean, shit. I mean, he rolls his wife under the bus, so probably paid a, a bribe. Yeah. Uh, but but he, so wait, he was found guilty of murdering somebody. <laughs> And yet these people were getting killed left and right for being witches. <laughs> and he like testified against his wife. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. May maybe a little bit of karma came back to him. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but on April um, 1692, Giles Corey was accused of witchcraft. And that's when shit gets real. You can murder people, but do not make a deal with the devil. So, um, 
So Giles Corey refused to enter a plea and attempt to prevent his case from going to trial. He reportedly knew he was going to die either in jail or on the gallows, and he wanted to avoid being convicted before he did. So as a result, Giles Corey was tortured for three days in a field on Howard Street in Salem Town in an attempt to force a plea out of him. They basically would just pile on like these rocks until they basically just pressed him to death, and he died in September 19th, 1692. Now, those he randomly the- died on the 19th. Right? Isn't that crazy? That's pretty weird. Um, also, I want to mention that two dogs were also executed during <laughs> the trials because they thought that they were also possessed by the devil. Black dogs. Of course. No black mm-hmm. cats? I don't see anything. Oh, I don't know about cats. Lord. No, those were probably. It's because the That's- true witches were the black cats and they knew better. They knew better. So, um, how does this thing come to an end? Like, how do we wrap this up? So oh, after he kills the, each other, <laughs> pretty much <laughs> come from space. He killed off everybody in the village. So after weeks of like these crazy hearings or formal hearings, Sir William Phipps, who was the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, interceded and add um, to add some formality to the proceedings. And he's like, okay, let me try to come in, add some formality. Maybe we could actually have evidence or you know cross examination, things like that. Um, but over the following year, many trials were held and many people were in prison. As the trials continued, accusations extended beyond Salem to surrounding communities. So after Governor Phipps's wife was accused, that's when it all stops. <laughs> uh, finally <laughs> reached the right person. <laughs> and ordered that a new court be established that would not allow um, so-called spectacle evidence. And by May 1693, everyone in custody under conviction or suspicion of witchcraft had been pardoned by Phipps. The trials did not officially end until the governor of the colony's wife was accused of witchcraft and ordered to end the trials, but not until after 20 people died. Um, And the thing that I think is so sad is that, you know, you just basically accuse the wrong person and it's like, oh. And also um, what you may not realize about Salem, too, is a lot of stuff like after this happened, it was like they just went back to business like, meh, it's fine. Like, oops, sorry. Like, we're good. If These only girls, John Proctor had written a letter accusing the governor's wife in the first place. Right. This would have all been so, over so quickly. <laughs> these girls go on to live relatively normal lives. A lot of this, like the jails and stuff are destroyed. It's almost like they tried to just wipe out that this ever happened. And so they were able to keep like uh, Judge Haw- Hawthorne's house, and, like different things like that. They were able to kind of uncover like the jails they've had to like remake to look like it. Because it's almost like they're like, oh, this didn't happen. Like we're good. We're moving on now. Back to business after this horrible horrible thing happened and remember like the people that were accused and they were in jail i mean even though they didn't die like these conditions like what that would do to you mentally and physically i can't even i can't even imagine um but they're terrible you you have to google it and look at these jails like we got to go visit replicas and it's it's awful um but these days uh salem is pretty amazing it's like halloween town central um but before um, all of this and um, this happened, um, Arthur Miller, who we talked about, who wrote The Crucible in 1952, he came to Salem to try to talk to people. And he said locals would not even talk to him. They said he said that in the 50s, no one would say anything about it. They would not talk about it. It's almost like this just didn't happen there. And so, as I mentioned early, if, you, if you're still with me, early in the podcast, for centuries, Salem's biggest court basically made them one of the town new england's most prominent towns because they had that port but whenever it had fallen on hard times and that port closed salem became extremely poor and so like it goes to like you know you have this awesome like new england town thriving we're not talking about witches that was way back in our past it's the 50s 60s 1950s and 60s and we're you know, all of a sudden we're on hard times. Our port closes. That's what everybody in Salem does pretty much for a living. What do we do? Well, there's a sitcom called Bewitched. What if we could get bewitched <laughs> here in Salem and we could really embrace this whole witch thing again, make it the witchy city and then basically take our past and intertwine this and then ended up working like a charm, honestly. Um, some of the re- residents had a huge problem with it because they were like, 
Samantha Stevens is a witch. Like, you know, in the sitcom, obviously, I'm not accusing Elizabeth Montgomery of witchcraft, but um, they're like, these people weren't. And so that some of them felt like it was kind of distasteful to do it. But then other people were like, well, no, it's a way to honor these people. And, you know, also it's a great way to get tourists here and market it. And so um, so basically it, became, it has become the lovable city that we know. They had this huge, like, um, statue of Elizabeth Montgomery, like, right in the center of downtown. It's so awesome. And I really love this because, and I'm going to end with this. Um, so there's an episode of Bewitched that um, – that basically it I'm going to read what she says and end the story because I think it just sums this up popular or just wonderfully. But in 1970, um, they were filming Bewitched in Salem and Samantha Stevens, um, who was, you know, a sorceress travels back in time and is put on trial at the Salem witch trials. Like this is like one of these episodes and the accused of witchcraft in old Salem, she winds up um, on the trial for her life at these people. And so this is what she says. She says to the courtroom that she will prove that no 17th century suspect was a witch. How can you imprison someone who can vanish before your very eyes? She demands. Firmly, she sets out Puritan forebearer straight. The people that you prosecuted were guiltless. They were mortals just like yourselves. You are the guilty, she informs the old cell knights before she vanishes. And at last, clearing the air. So... Basically, um, it's Witchy City now, but before it was crazy, awesome seaport. We're not talking about witches. And then it starts, Salem starts with witches. So it just kind of comes full circle. And I think it's great that they embrace witches. And like, there's so many cool like, witchcraft shops. Like um, there's a shop just for um, just for spirit boards. There's shop. There's like a Halloween like museum that has like all like the boo buckets from like the 80s. There's just like they really embrace it and they do such a good job of not forgetting the past, like reviving that past and telling those stories. And it's just I I don't know what else I can say about how wonderful Salem is. They turn something really horrific into something great, and they really um, build on trying to teach people a lesson. So that's it's almost like the uh, people who falsely accuse people of witch cl- witchcraft just manifested the hell out of this being a city full of witches. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> celebrating and I love it because, like, we went, um, we went in like uh, July, so the fourth, like, the fourth end of June, beginning of July, and like you're just walking down the street and people are just wearing witch hats, capes, vampire fangs, and no one looks at you like you're a weirdo. It's like. Nobody gives shit, you know, it's like, it's great. It's so, it's so fun. So if witches are your thing, um, if Hocus Pocus is your thing, I mean, yes, like you will love it. And, um, you know, we got to see all the the Hocus Pocus sites, which was really cool. And they just, they do a great, Salem's got it going on. It's my favorite city. I love it there so much. It's so fun. Um, If you've never been, do yourself a favor, book yourself a trip, go, I would love to go during Halloween and everybody there told me that you have to, it's a must or like, but if you want to actually see stuff, they're like, don't come in Halloween because it's such a crazy time. Like it's hard to get in the museums and the restaurants and everything. They're like, but it is the party like you've never seen. Um, so they're like, come not at Halloween time to actually see stuff. I'm like, and then just come at Halloween time ready to party and have a time of your life. But they do um, trick or treating with the mayor. And so all the like, the kids and the mayor are trick or treating together. And um, where we stayed, they at Hawthorne, they said that um, sometimes people like, you know, book these rooms years in advance and they come like every Halloween. Like that's their ritual. They're always there every single Halloween. And I'm like, that is so awesome. And like, they'll decorate the Halloween, like the windows and stuff. And, so I really want to go there on Halloween and just chill out and see it all. Yeah, that'd be fun. I, I'm definitely down since my last two or three Halloweens have been ruined. Right. <laughs> oh. We need to make it up. I mean, like we need to go out Salem style. <laughs> I yeah. think you would love it, Adele. I think you would absolutely love it. It's just such a fun place. And it's just, and it's such a, you know, it's such a great, it's just gorgeous. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed the story. I know we ran a little long, but I really, I was just going to tell you, like, just list the names and it's like, here's what everybody has in common, like you had mentioned, but I just felt like these people deserve more than that. And they deserved a little blurb at least, um, 
because it really sucks what happened to them just for being outspoken or just being somebody that you you don't like and to have your life in that way is really horrible and you know I think we see that unfortunately today like when we see people we don't understand it's easier just to get rid of them than it is to accept them and, and not saying that these people did anything wrong and you know other people yeah. don't do anything wrong either for being who they are but it's just uh, um it's crazy. yeah it's definitely the the danger of tribalism and we're definitely seeing a lot of tribalism right now in america which is pretty yes. horrifying yes which is why i kind of when i didn't really know what i wanted to cover really and just just sort of everything just kind of led me to salem and when i i looked on my phone i had some pictures and i'm like you know what i feel like this story needs to be told and it's a good time for it to be told um because, you know, we do like we it makes me really sad how much we really have not changed at all um, since then. And it, it's very heartbreaking. It's just we just find instead of accusing somebody of a witch, we accuse, you know, you're gay. So therefore, like you're a pedophile, you're this, you're that. And we put these labels on you that are not true. And ultimately, a lot of people die because of it. Same things with Black Lives Matter with women. Like we stereotype and we just make all these false accusations that are not true and ultimately, um, sadly enough, death is sometimes the consequence and these stories as well. And it just um, it's very heartbreaking how how we can come so far in so many ways. And when it comes to just treating humans with respect and having a fair court and fair things, we just really sometimes I feel like we haven't really gone too far. And that's very alarming and sad to me. Yeah, absolutely. Those are my thoughts on the same moment's trial. What about you? You got any? thoughts comments anything that sits with you well yeah as i mentioned the tribalism but it's still you know it's all just distractions with that shit it really is just the one percent trying to keep us all down so the sooner we get past our own bullshit and realize it's us versus them not us versus us we can move on and change legislation and actually stick up for one another so i agree and that's right that's what i love about this story is I do. I, I think I mentioned it earlier in the podcast. I think this is maybe the first time we are seeing how the one percent plays out. And um, so, you know, you figure Salem's got to be one of the oldest towns, right? Like in America, I would Politics imagine was one one percenter being accused and actually being treated like the rest of us, and suddenly off. legislation changes. Come exactly. on, that's exactly what we can do today, people. That's exactly right. And it's like, how many innocent people have to live like this, you know? And, and it, I just, I think that these stories are so relevant today. And I know there's a lot of, you know, debate about your past and everything, but we can't cover up the past. I mean, these cruel things have happened all through time. And we have to, I think, give power back to the victims and tell these stories and really tell these stories for how horrific they were. We don't need to sugarcoat them and make them cute and sweet and blah, blah, blah. We need to be honest about what happened. We need to tell the stories. We need to honor the victims. We need to learn and really apply it in our lives to, to, to move forward. And like you said, I mean, I think the one thing we see in connection with all these stories is the one percenters that hold hold us down and, and, um, make things hard for those that, you know, have opinions or, you know, have a brain or, you know, may, maybe yeah. they just like foot ointment. It doesn't mean you're a witch. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she's just really good with herbs. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. And so, yeah. So I hope that the story strikes a chord with you listeners. I hope that if you haven't been to Salem, I really hope that you go. This is my shout out to Salem. It's an awesome, awesome place. And, um, and I just hope you kind of remember these people, um, you know, keep them in your in your mind. And um, there's a place um, there at Salem that has a memorial for every one of them that you can walk on. People will come and bring like flowers and stuff. It's really it's really neat. So um, they definitely deserve to be mentioned. Yeah, that's awesome. It was a good story. Well, thanks. I know it ran a little long, but I think it was so worth it. And I really enjoyed telling it. Yeah, it's always a good one. Yes. Well, I, I, well, even though these folks weren't witches, I do love witches. So <laughs> I always love a good witch story for sure. Even yeah. though this wasn't really that, but. <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah, well, cool. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, be sure to let us know. We would love to hear your feedback. And if you have any ideas for future stories you'd like to hear, get in contact. Just go to stormywillow.com. 
and you can listen or uh, get in contact with us. All the ways to connect are on our website. All right, guys. Well, as we say here, stay curious. And stay safe. And hopefully you won't be accused of being a witch. <laughs> or a witch. Or if you are, hopefully, you know, there are laws to protect you from getting hanged. <laughs> no? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. We'll see. Maybe you'll get a fear trial, depending <laughs> I, on what you know, state you're in. I, I'm not going to end on that note. We'll be here for another yeah. hour. <laughs> This is not my political podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just have to make a, a separate political podcast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Yeah. Catch you guys next time. Bye. Bye.